بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم قال الله عز وجل إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وصل على المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات وبارك على محمد وأزواجه وذريته Respected brothers and sisters Last week we studied the first migration that took place in Islam which was the migration of a group of companions radiallahu anhum from Mecca Mukarrama to Al Habasha which is present day Ethiopia We spoke about the conversation that took place between Negus Najashi, the emperor of Ethiopia and the Muslims and the call of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu who was the spokesperson on behalf of the Muslims. From that story we derived a few important lessons which is that da'wah should always be implicitly made when we are conveying the truth and when we are speaking to people. So even though Ja'far radiallahu anhu was asked a few questions by Najashi, he was also implicitly making da'wah to him by calling him towards the true belief regarding Isa alayhi salatu salam. Though Najashi was a Christian himself, however Christianity had, you can say, corrupted the meaning of belief in Isa alayhi salatu salam by introducing theories like or theologies or like the uh, Trinity and he had become Trinitarian Ja'far radiallahu anhu wanted to convey the truth about Isa alayhi salatu salam so we're going to move on from that story by deriving a few more lessons because the question about hijrah is an important one so we see that a group of Muslims were encouraged by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to migrate from Mecca to Ethiopia due to the oppression that they were facing and that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa himself had also migrated from Mecca to Medina due to the relentless persecution that the Quraysh had meted out against the believers and the Muslims. So the question about migration usually comes up specifically for Muslims living in non-Muslim lands is it necessary to make hijrah? Do we have to make hijrah? And you'll sometimes hear certain speakers and certain callers and certain da'i saying that Muslims should not be living in non-Muslim lands and they should move to a Muslim land and so on and so forth. And for all practical purposes, the question that I would like to ask them is, where is that true Muslim land that you keep speaking about, which is a utopian land that you keep mentioning? Because if we look around the world, we don't see any of those lands where the Sharia is properly and correctly implemented in the legal system in every other way. And in fact, the freedom to practice Islam in the countries that we're living in are far more than sometimes the freedoms in other countries. If you go to some Muslim countries, you can't even gather, you can't even gather or make an ijtima like you can in this country. Like if you were to go to a Saudi, for example, just as an example, and you were to host a program or a gathering, there's no way that you could gather a thousand people or 500 people for a talk without the authorities coming after you and inquiring why this is happening and, and under whose supervision or under whose approval this type of gathering is taking place. In, in most of these countries, this is how it is. People that have lived in those countries can tell you. So the point that some people try to push that you know these are Muslim countries, but the question does arise, what do we mean by a Muslim country? So the question about hijrah, especially for people that are living in non-Muslim lands like ourselves, who are born and raised here, for example. Right? Some people migrated here, but some people are born and raised here, they're second generation, third generation immigrants, and this is their home and they have no other home. So to ask them to migrate can only be done if there's no freedom to practice their faith or where there is 
persecution and harassment to the point where a person's life is endangered and they cannot freely express their Islam and live it. And if that were the case where the symbols of Islam are uh, abandoned and the commandments of Islam can no longer be carried out or preserved and that a person finds it difficult to avoid prohibitions because he's forced to accept them and practice them, then that's a different scenario. And this is what the Muslims had faced in Makkah Mukarramah, which was a hostile land. And that's why they were forced to migrate to either Ethiopia at one point or Medina Munawwara. But if there's peace in the land for people and citizens who have signed the treaty or agreed to a treaty that they will abide by certain laws and certain agreements and they will be given freedom and protection of their dignity, their honor, their property, their life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, whatever you want to call it. As we know, uh, the, free, uh, the Declaration of Independence here. And we're living it and we see we're able to establish our masajid, our makatib, our madaris, our schools, Islamic uh, um, organizations, relief organizations, we perform our ibadat here, we're able to carry out our zakat, we're able to carry out all of our duties. And we're not forced to indulge in that muharramat and the haram way of living or life, then to ask uh, for, for, individual, for us in this situation to migrate is not necessary. Absolutely not. So I just wanted to make that point that of course, we have to remember and realize that preservation of Islam it takes precedence over preservation of life as well when we speak about the objectives of Sharia, right? Generally speaking, so saving your life is very, uh, saving your deen is very important because deen and religion is the basis upon which the society functions and the rights of people are preserved. And this is what our understanding is that Islam is that system that preserves the rights and protects the wealth and the land, freedom and dignity of the people. So Muslims must exhaust all finances and whatever is necessary for them to preserve that. And that's why even living in this country as Muslims, it's incumbent upon us to exhaust our resources to preserve our deen and preserve our identity as Muslims. And we're doing that. And this is what Allah demands of us in the Quran when he says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ And strive in the way of Allah and exhaust in the way of Allah according to the rights of its religion or his religion. So the point is that for us to survive as a community, our deen has to survive. And that is our first priority as Muslims. Because if deen is lost, then everything is meaningless after that. But if Islam is strong in a society and there's reverence for Islam in the hearts of the people and it's firm in the hearts of people, then even after we have exhausted so many things, we get more in return. Now think about the hijrah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba left everything behind in order to migrate to Medina Munawwara, but Allah rewarded them with much more. So sometimes those types of sacrifices have to be made. But otherwise, if there is no threat to the deen of the individual or their family or their community, and they're able to practice their deen freely with dignity, with honor, then migration is not necessary for those people. And this is what the ulama have also mentioned. So when people make these types of statements, blanket statements uh, without qualifying, without explaining, uh, without providing any context that Muslims cannot live in a non-Muslim land and Muslims have to migrate from the non-Muslim land. Again, the same fit and, and the same tribulations and trials that people are facing in the West, you will find those types of tribulations appearing or those fit and mischiefs appearing because of the internet and because of popular culture in Muslim countries too or Muslim majority countries as well. So you always find that. Of course, one may argue that there is a, uh, an environment of people praying or there's an environment of people, uh, you know. But then let's, let's take, for example, in some of the countries that are majority Muslim countries, even for a person to survive on a day-to-day -day becomes difficult sometimes when there is bribery and corruption in the people in law enforcement to a level that, I'm not saying that there's no corruption or bribe uh, in, in law enforcement in, in, in the lands that we're living, I'm not saying that. But the level of corruption that you find within the people in the, the countries that, uh, that are majority Muslim, sometimes it's, it's extremely um, 
difficult to say that that's a better place for Muslims to live in. Like even if some of the I, I don't even want to na- I don't want to name any countries, but some of the brothers, sisters that are listening, they're well aware of the, what I'm talking about here, right? So I think that for us to practice our deen and to even make da'wah, and especially if we change our intention and say that our purpose for being here is not necessarily economic, but it's to teach the deen, convey the deen, and we actively pursue that goal, which is important, actively pursue that goal, not just stay dormant and quiet and silent and and become quietists and don't contribute to society, don't positively make an impact in the country that we're in, then of course it's a different argument, but if we are actively pursuing the goals of da'wah, conveying the message of Islam to the people, and, and, and spending our resources in doing so, then I would say that it's to make hijrah or to migrate away from peaceful lands that we're living in where we're able to practice our deen freely and live a life of dignity and honor uh, and, and our rights are protected, then that is probably a better option than some of the options that are available in Muslim countries or Muslim majority countries. And I have to qualify that when I say Muslim countries because again, as I mentioned, to find a country today where there is an implementation of Sharia to, you know, in a correct manner, it, it's very difficult to find. Right. So, um, you know, I know that we we have this idealist, ideal, idealistic society uh, mentality some people have, and they always like to romanticize about certain countries and so. But then the reality is that, you know, they enjoy the fruits of living in the lands that we're living in. They enjoy the fruits and the freedoms, and they wouldn't make the move. So it's all just talk at the end of the day, and there's no substance behind it. And uh, that might sound that might sound quite harsh. Some people may not like that, but it's the reality and it's the truth. Because if if they were serious about it, they would have made the move by now. Right? So people like to talk without really um, having any substance behind it. I want to move on from there. I want to make a few more points, inshallah, about this story of Najashi because it's a very interesting story and a very important story of migration. Urwat ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu says that Jafar radiallahu anhu, when Najashi was approached by Amr ibn al-As and Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah from the Quraysh, Jafar radiallahu anhu said, Emperor Najashi, ask them three questions on our behalf. Ask them, were we anyone's slaves and we escaped? Ask them, did we kill or murder someone and we escaped from Mecca? Did we usurp or take or seize somebody's wealth unlawfully and then escape? So Najashi had posed all three questions to Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu and asked him. So Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu at that time was not a Muslim and he became Muslim later on, of course. And he was, expon- he was a very uh, important figure later on. He was appointed as the governor of Egypt when Egypt came under Muslims. Right? So Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu was very important in Islamic history. So Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu responded saying, by Allah, they are not our slaves. And then he said, by Allah, they have not murdered a soul. And then he said, by Allah, they have not taken a cent or a dirham or a dinar from anybody. So then the Jashi also assured them that if they had taken anything, I will be in charge and be a guarantor on their behalf and repay it for them. But then when he learnt from the responses of Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu that no such thing had happened, then he said, leave them be. You have no reason to demand them and they will stay in my territory and my area. Now it's also mentioned that uh, Jafar and his companions, I was mentioning last week as well, and I'm going to reiterate it here because there's some important thing to mention here, is that Jafar when he was leaving with his companions, when did he leave to join Rasul Sallallahu Does anybody remember which battle it was? Which year? Khaybar, right? Khaybar was, was when? in the seventh year after Hijrah. So approximately three years after, before Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, three years and a bit before Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. Now at this time, when Jafar who is leaving to join the Muslims in Medina Munawwara with a group of companions, Najashi bears all the cost of the travel. 
he's such a great man with such great character. Not only does he allow them to live in his territory, in his land that he ruled for a decade, over a decade, but he's also bearing the expenses when they return to Medina Munawwara. And then he also sends an ambassador, a delegate with them and tells them, tells the delegates, tell Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I believe in Allah and I believe in him as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, notify him that I bear testimony that there is none worthy of worship but Allah and I also bear testimony that you are his Prophet. And, and then what does he say? Ask him to ask Allah to forgive me. Subhanallah. It's very touching and very beautiful. Jafar radiallahu says that when we left Abyssinia and headed towards Medina, we reached the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and he was extremely happy to see me. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said, I'm not sure if I'm happier with the victory in Khaybar or happier to see my brother Jafar radiallahu anhu because Jafar was the first cousin of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa the brother of Ali radiallahu anhu, Jafar bin Abi Talib. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa was extremely pleased and happy to see Jafar radiallahu anhu come. He says, I, you've brought me more joy. I don't know what's brought me more joy, the conquest of Khaybar or the arrival of Jafar. Then Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took a seat. The delegate of Najashi stands and says, O Prophet of Allah, here Jafar is right before you. Ask him how our emperor had treated him. Jafar radiallahu anhu said, no doubt Najashi gave us a warm welcome. He treated us in such a good manner. In fact, when we decided to depart, he provided us with conveyances and provisions for the journey. That's how brilliant he was with us. And he was always assisting us all the time. And then the Qasid, the delegate, relates to them, relates to Rasul Sallallahu the statements of Najashi. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instantly stands to his feet, performs wudu, and recites the following dua three times. Oh Allah, forgive Najashi. Oh Allah, forgive Najashi. Oh Allah, forgive Najashi. And all the Muslims in presence asad ameen. Jafar radiallahu anhu says, I requested the emperor's message to messenger to describe whatever he has seen here in Medina to Najashi. And we learn that Najashi had passed away not so long after this. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed his Salatul Janazah in absence. Absence, Salatul Janazah, Salatul Janazah lil ghaib. We're going to move on from this story. So this happens around when the, not this particular part of what, that we just mentioned, but the migration to Habasha happens in the fifth year. Now in the sixth year, the Islam of Umar radiallahu anhu happens, which we covered you know, before Ramadan in the Seerah class, the Islam of Umar radiallahu anhu and the Islam of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. Now, the Quraysh are embarrassed. All their efforts were in vain. Muslims were increasing in number. Even then, Muslims were weak in terms of their numbers and strength and their presence in Makkah Mukarramah and the Quraysh decided to up the ante, as they say in English, to increase their persecution against the Muslims. So in the seventh year after Hijrah, what do they decide? They decide to boycott Banu Hashim. An economic boycott, a social boycott. Basically, they put sanctions, just like big, powerful countries today in the world practice coercive measures against smaller countries for economic purposes or for humanitarian purposes to corner them, to force their hand, to make them toe the line or to come into line however they want them to dance or however they want them to jump or however they want them to behave. And we see all the time with different countries that go through these types of economic sanctions. Like right now, um, of course, uh, the rest of Europe has practiced this type of uh, sanctions on Russia, right? So we're aware of these types of things happening. So Banu Hashim is doing this, sorry, the Quraysh are doing this to Banu Hashim. All the tribes of the Quraysh gathered and they decided that we need to boycott 
Banu Hashim in order to force their hand. If we boycott them in this manner, then we will force them to give up Islam and to stop calling towards it. So this happens in the seventh year after Hijrah. And this lasts for three years. Some ulama say that it lasts for two years. But the majority say that it lasted for three years from the seventh year after Rasulullah became prophethood, seventh year after Ba'atha, to the tenth year after Ba'atha. So three years. Now, all of the Muslims were boycotted and Banu Hashim and Banu Abdul Muttalib, basically the family of Rasulullah who supported them, whether they were Muslim or not, they were also boycotted. The only one amongst them that did not join the boycott and actually join the Quraysh in this campaign was Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, the uncle of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whom Allah has cursed in the Quran, Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab in Watab, he did not join his family. But the rest of the people, because there was always this brotherhood between families, this tribal uh, bond that was extremely strong. So if my family member is suffering, then I will also endure that pain and, and join him in that suffering. So that was a type of bond that the, Quray, uh, that the Banu Hashim had with one another despite Muslims, uh, despite some of them not being Muslim. Like the uncle of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Talib, the other uncle, who was his supporter throughout the years, he was also boycotted in this manner. So there's a few very important lessons to learn from these boycotts as well. That uh, Banu Hashim supported the Muslims in their time of need and joined them in their struggle. Likewise, you know, building alliances of this type with oppressed minorities in this country becomes important for Muslims as well, such as the African American community, as an example. Right? So, this is uh, something for us to learn from the seerah of Rasulullah. Now, what were the terms of the boycott? The terms of the boycott were nobody can, there's no intermarriage between the Muslims or Banu Hashim and every, anyone else. Number one. Number two, not to trade with them. So there's no buying or selling. Number three, not to allow any provisions to reach them. And number four, not to show any leniency towards them. So these are very, very harsh conditions. Now, they also drew up these terms and hung it on the Ka'batullah, beginning with Bismik Allahumma, with the name of Allah, in your name, O Allah. And that was a custom, even because the Quraysh, the, the idolaters, they believed in Allah, but they ascribed partners to Him. But they didn't consider Him to be Rahman. They weren't aware of the term Rahman. And that's why, if you remember, in the sixth year after Hijrah, when the treaty of Hudaybiyah takes place and the, that treaty is written, Ali radiallahu anhu is asked to write and be the scribe for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa tells him to begin with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and Suhail bin Amr, who's on behalf of the Quraysh, says, We don't recognize Rahman. And Ali radiallahu anhu was, was not happy. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, Okay, omit that. Just put Bismik Allahumma. So this is this is, so we know that this was a tradition during those times. Bismik Allahumma. In in your name, O oh Allah. Or with your name, O oh Allah. And then they wrote the terms of the uh, of the um, uh, boycott. And they hung it up on the Kaabatullah because the Kaabatullah is a revered place, as if to say that this is now endorsed by Allah. As if to say that now this is the endorsed by Allah, we are doing the right thing. Look at the audacity. Of these people So they drew up this accord And it was written by who? Mansur ibn Ikramah And it's mentioned that Allah Ta'ala punished him in a very severe way His fingers became paralyzed He was unable to write again That was a punishment from Allah And sometimes Allah Azza wa Jal Postpones punishment till the hereafter But at times Allah Afflicts people with punishment in this dunya as well in this world as well Allah humiliates people in the dunya as well So Mansur bin Ikrama, The one who wrote this His, uh, his fingers became paralyzed Now what happens is Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And Abu Talib Who was you know, one of the seniors Amongst the Banu Hashim They take refuge you can say 
in the valley of Abu Talib. So each tribe had their own little area within Mecca. So there was an area called Sha'ab Abi Talib, which is difficult to identify today because of all the construction around the Kaabatullah. And there's so much expansion around uh, Masjid Haram going on. But that was a designated and defined area before the valley of Abu Talib, Sha'ab Abi Talib. But this is where the uh, Banu Hashim were residing and they were staying. Now the Quraysh stayed very committed to their terms because they were very hostile and their noses were cut. Arrogant people, boastful, their campaign to bring the Muslims back from Abyssinia was unsuccessful. So this is uh, you know, a step above now, and then they were, they were very, very committed to this boycott. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum went through some very difficult and harsh times as you can imagine. As you can imagine, when there's no provisions coming in, there's no trade going on, and you're also boycotted, you can't make any decisions, you can't be part of any decision-making process for the city, you can imagine how difficult this time was. And it's mentioned by Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu, he says that one night, you know, my, uh, he says, I was out and I was extremely hungry to the point that I was going to starve, starve to death. And I stepped on something moist. I picked it up and I gulped it straight away. I didn't even know what it was. Till today, I don't know what I ate. He says, another occasion, I went out to relieve myself and I stepped on camel skin. And he says, I crushed it into powder as much as I can, and I mixed it with water and drank it for a couple of days. This was the sacrifice that Rasulullah and the Sahaba faced or gave for Allah's deen to reach us today. SubhanAllah, and we take our deen for granted. We have opportunities to learn our deen and we don't take those opportunities. We take it for granted. We can't even make a small effort to learn our deen sometimes. And we're so quick to discard the teachings of our deen based on just a few circumstances, a few difficulties. We're ready to discard our deen, do things out of convenience or leave things out of convenience. And this is the sacrifice of the earlier Muslims, radiallahu anhum. And this was a serious time for character building. Now it makes you understand when Umar anhu becomes Khalifa and the Islamic territory is spreading so vastly and so many riches are coming under Muslim control and Umar anhu still during that time when he stands on the pulpit somebody counts 11 or 12 patches on his clothes Umar anhu Subhanallah when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is resting on a straw mat and Umar radiallahu anhu is visiting him and says, Oh Rasulullah, it hurts me to see you resting on this straw mat while you have marks on your body because of the mat and the kings of Persia and Rome are in their palaces. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Oh Umar, are you not pleased that we have the akhirah? And they have the dunya and they have the world. Are you not pleased that we will be given the riches of the hereafter? And it just shows you that the Sahaba whom were not swayed by worldly pleasures and desires because of these sacrifices and the character building that took place in Makkah Mukarrama, which made them resilient. Remember, these 13 years, even though Muslims faced hostility and persecution, there was no command for them to fight or to retaliate or make jihad. Rather, there was encouragement to do sabr, be resilient, be patient, face the persecution, trials, tribulations. Am hasibtu man tadkhulul jannah? Do you think that you're going to reach jannah while you have not faced similar sacrifices to those who came before you? Allah is telling the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Masathum al ba'sa wa dara wa zulzilu. Difficulties, trials came upon them. And they were shook. 
to the point that a messenger and those who believed with him may, would say, when is Allah's help going to come? Listen, Allah's help is near. Ala inna nasr Allahi qareeb. Subhanallah. So when you look at this, you know, this condition of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, it, just, it gives you an understanding of how these people sacrificed and why they were the best group of people, why they were the best companions. And that's why people that witnessed them who were not Muslim would also say, I have never seen a group of people love a person like the Sahaba radiallahu anhum loved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Never seen a group of people love their leader like a group of like the Sahaba radiallahu anhum loved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This character building was built upon the teachings of the Quran. Revelations were still coming down upon them to teach them about Islam. Now it happens that one time a trade caravan came and one of the believers went out to trade with them. So a caravan came from abroad, you can say, from outside of Mecca. And Abu Lahab had announced to all of the merchants that came from outside, nobody is to sell to Banu Hashim or the Muslimin. And if you are incurring any loss, I will cover it. In fact, raise your prices high. So the prices were escalated and increased. Muslims were unable to purchase anything. And the children were crying. And they were eating leaves and whatever was available to them. Now what happens is, how does this boycott end? Some people couldn't stand that their family members were suffering. There's an incident of Hakim bin Hizam. Hakim bin Hizam was the nephew of whom? Khadija radiallahu anha. And he embraced Islam later on. But Hakim bin Hizam sent some food with his servants to Khadija radiallahu anha. And Abu Jahl spotted him. And Abu Jahl became really angry. I will never tolerate you taking any food for them. I will humiliate you in front of everybody. Another man known as Abu al-Bakhtari was there and he said, what is your problem if he is sending food to his relatives? Abu Jahl mentioned some expletives. Abu al-Bakhtari had a camel's bone and smacked him in the head until he was in pain. But what uh, scared him more was that Hamza radiallahu anhu was watching from a distance. But you can see that even companions like Hamza radiallahu anhu at that time, they endured the sacrifice. They didn't retaliate, even though they had strength and they were uh, influential before they became Muslim. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had not received any instruction from Allah to respond in this manner, rather to just bear the difficulty with, sacrifice, uh, with, with patience and resilience. So it happens later on that a group of people became really, really disturbed by this condition. And the man, Hisham bin Amr, was the first one he went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's, uh, you can say Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's cousin. And his name um, is mentioned here. Let me pull up his name. Zuhair bin Umayyah. He was the son of Atika bin Abdul Mut- bint Abdul Muttalib. So just like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the son of Abdullah bin Abdul Muttalib. He was basically Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's uh, paternal aunt's son paternal aunt's son, Zuhair bin Umayyah. So this man, Hisham bin Umar, Umar goes to him and says, how can you see your own tribes? Because So Zuhair did not become Muslim until this point. Up until this point, he was not Muslim. He becomes Muslim later on during Fatah Makkah in the eighth year after Hijrah. So he, has, he was not part of this treaty. He may have been one of these family members that did not join the uh, Banu Hashim in the boycotts. So Hisham bin Umar goes up to him and says, I'm finding it very difficult now after all these years seeing the Muslims in this condition. And these are your relatives. How can you see them in this condition? And he says that, you know, I'm one man, what can I do? So he said, let's go to somebody else as well. So they go to Mut'im bin Adi and they share this concern with Mut'im bin Adi. Then Abu al-Bakhtari and five people get together and say that we're going to raise this issue with the Quraysh. And when the Quraysh had gathered, they raised this issue. Abu Jahl rejected it. They responded, Abu Jahl responded, and then Abu Jahl realized that these people are serious and they've already made up their minds. In the meanwhile, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told his uncle Abu Talib. 
the terms that have been drawn up by the Quraysh and placed on the Kaabatullah, Allah has caused ants to eat up this charter and the only thing that remains on the charter is the name of Allah. Abu Talib said, is that so? Abu Talib speaks to the Quraysh and says that my nephew has informed me and my nephew has never lied to me that the charter that you guys have drawn has nothing remaining on it but the name of Allah. And if what he is saying is true, then this treaty, uh, this, this, this boycott ends. And the Quraysh agreed to this term. And when they went and discovered, they saw that the, the charter had been omitted by the ants that Allah Ta'ala had caused to eat and the, 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 the agreement. And the only thing that was remaining after the three years was the name of Allah on that charter. Bismik Allahumma. So this was the way that the boycott ended. And... Muslims were able to now freely go out and live, but they were still not able to actively and publicly call people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or towards Islam. So we're going to move on from this story, inshallah, because a few more stories that are going to come now. Ta'if, the story of Ta'if is going to come. A very important story that took place in the ninth year after Rasulullah's prophethood. There's going to be Isra wal Mi'raj, there's going to be the year of sorrow, Amul Huzn, and then there's also going to be uh, the Bay'atul Aqaba til Ula wa Thaniya, basically the pledge of Aqaba. And the pledge of Aqaba is what lays down the foundations for the big migration. And that migration is from Mecca to Medina, which is the turning point of Islam. When we look at the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa there's many instances you can look at and say, well, this was a really, really important turning point for Islam and Muslims, but there was none bigger than the migration to Medina Munawwara because that turned the tables completely. Right? So, um, inshallah, we're going to go chronologically in order and cover these stories. We pray that Allah Azza wa Jal allows us to learn from these stories and Allah Ta'ala um, you know, builds our iman, you know, our, our gives us gives us strength in our faith through the stories of the seer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, wa nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.